Hello on the Rockers. On this episode, we're zooming in from home. We're doing a casual tonight. We are getting baked, as in carbs. Everybody calm down. With Food Network's chef Zach Young to chat career, baking tips, baking championships, and a lot more with me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. It's on the rocks. and most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On The Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On The Rocks. Fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy night. It's going to be a bumpy night. Buns and Bells and Candy House on the Rock podcast, a place where two glams to give a damn. James Corden, what are you doing? Uh, first, you make the gays mad for being in the prom. Then you piss off L.A. by taking over the streets with your musicals. Um, and now you're getting kicked out of restaurants? Uh, girl, what is going on? Are you becoming the new Ellen? Just less famous and less rich? <clears throat> Anyway, James, get it together, girl. Uh, like us on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air and on Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, pride, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up. Info at on the rocks radio show.com. The show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch uh, our now over 300 episodes at on the rocks radio show.com. Watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the outer.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Okay, we have, we got so many questions from you guys. So we're just going to jump in. Let's get the show on the road. A huge, huge fan. So excited he's here. Zach Young, named one of the top 10 pastry chefs in America by Desert, or Desert. <laughs> dessert professional. He's known for his playful takes on American desserts, including the all-in-one the pie cake in, which is responsible for my COVID weight. Thank you very much. Uh, he's best known for his final four finish on the inaugural season of Bravo Top Shelf Just Desserts, the cooking channel's long-running show Unique Sweets, and of course his costumes and witty commentary on Food Network's Halloween Bacon Championship. He frequently appears on Chopped, Beat Bobby Flay, Worst Cooks in America, Bakers vs. Fakers, and Best Bakers in America, as well as Supermarket Stakeout and Santos Baking Blizzard. His live cooking classes on the Food Network Kitchen app allow every culinary enthusiast to cook along with him as he prepares his favorite dishes, both sweet and savory. And you have to check out his Instagram, because he's baking and cooking all the time. Please welcome Zach Young. Cheers. Welcome. You are like, you know how to do this. You're ready with like the bar behind you. You've got the pumpkins. Like you are just ready to go. You know, when you have 700 square feet in New York City, uh, <laughs> the important things, the bar and the seasonal decor, that's what you do. <laughs> Literally, that's it. I sleep here under the stairs like Harry Potter. Well, you know what's funny? Like all these New York apartments are going viral because people are showing exactly where they live. And I think one girl had like a 300 square foot and it was literally, and she pays like almost uh, $2,000 for it. It's ridiculous. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, I've lived, I've lived here for 19 years, like this month. Wow. And I was thinking kind of about my entire trajectory of like living on 110th Street and Park, yeah. in the heart of Spanish Harlem. When I first moved here, I stayed there for seven years. I actually loved that neighborhood. I loved that neighborhood. But that apartment, it was a sixth floor walk up, which is interesting because the building only had five floors <laughs> legally. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, and that's how you burn off your pie cake and calories. You know, it's all those walk ups, right? <laughs> well, you at that point, that at that point, I was eating uh, frozen spinach and canned tuna, and that was it, because that was all that was all I could afford. Uh, oh, and it's funny you bring that up, because before we get into all the Food Network questions, and we got all of your questions, and we're going to get to them all, I want to talk about early, Zach. Um, you're a main boy, lobsters and everything. Is it true that you wanted to learn baking because your mother deprived you of decent cookies or any cookies? <laughs> Is that true? Uh, you know, um, I have the most amazing family ever. Uh, my mother, uh, Sue Young, is, you know, truly like 
the kindest, most loving, um, most incredible mother, except for the fact that food was not love. Uh, <laughs> we ate so we didn't die. My mother was way ahead of her time in, you know, gluten-free, veganism, um, farm to table. I mean, we'd go shopping at the food co-op, um, which now as an adult yes. actually is incredible because my relationship with food is so much better now. You know, we, we were eating kale and quinoa before you could pronounce it. <laughs> uh, but it was it was challenging growing up because no one would trade snacks with me at lunch. Like, I have some hummus. You guys want some hummus? And they're like, what's that? That's not a Dunkaroo. Um, so, yeah, I think baking was was kind of my final act of rebellion because honestly, nothing else worked. Like, crashed cars. She's like, that's fine. That's what insurance is for. Uh, you know, came out. She's yeah. like honey, I always knew. Uh, and then I'm like, mom, I want to be a pastry chef. And she's not like, in this house. Yeah, I, did, I didn't raise you with those values. Um, but, I, 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 I love their name is like Sue Young from Maine. Like in my mind, she should be solving murders as she's like shopping at the co-op, you know. But bicycling, Cabot Cove. Yeah, yeah. That, that whole thing. Um, but my, my grandmother was an incredible cook. Um, and she actually, she was a, a Renaissance woman, um, way ahead of her time. She, you know, owned restaurants or owned a restaurant, owned antique store, owned like racehorses. I mean, she was like just feisty, independent, you know, slightly ornery down East woman, um, but just the most amazing cook. So my my biggest food memories growing up were, were with her and, you know, dur during the holidays because... Sue Young wasn't cooking. Um, Certainly so, not in my oven. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what kind of kids you were. I know you did theater. Uh, you started doing theater, community, children's theater, uh, very young. Um, and then you went to school for it. Were you kind of this introvert kid? Were you always like on stage, jazz hands and all, spotlights? Or what kind of kid um, were you? I think I was, I was a kid that no one knew what to do with. You know, like in eighth grade um, biology class, the teacher came in and I was dancing with the skeleton. Like, who does that? And I was also the kid who they had to stop sending me to the principal's office because I loved the principal. I would rather be in the principal's office than in class with my peers. Um so I was kind of this like slightly rambunctious yet misfit, you know, like I didn't, I, I never really related to my peers yeah. except in theater and in dance. And um, I was always with the adults. I, I, I know exactly what, what that's like. I always got better uh, or along better with the adults and the kids either bored me or I didn't know how to play with them. It, it was just, awkward and my best time was with with, with uh, older people um and audience would, <laughs> would be interested to learn your first designs were not even from the kitchen they were in the costume kind of um era um how did you go from the stage to being a costumer uh wig department radio city music hall H how did that transition happen you know the whole time i was doing theater uh growing up you know through like community theater, theater camp, high school, college. Uh, when I was doing any form of theater, I'd always find myself in the costume shop, um, hanging out. Yeah. And one day, one of them said to me, like, if you're going to hang out here, we're going to put you to work. Here's a seam ripper. And they started showing me how to sew and let me into their design process. And all of that. I ended up spending more time in the costume shop than I did in rehearsals. So when I moved to New York, I did a couple of survival jobs. Um, you know, my, my first one, I worked coat check at Tao, the original <laughs> Tao, like in the Lindsay Lohan days. Like, I mean, it was just crazy. I probably actually made more money working coat check at Tao, like minute by minute yeah. than I do now. Um, <laughs> And 
I sold furniture and then this opportunity came up. I, I knew the head of wardrobe at Radio City. She was the mother of a friend of mine. And I just ended up knocking on her door and saying, hey, like I would love to work here on the Christmas show. Oh. So I ended up working in the wig department. I mean, uh, that's amazing. That's like a bucket list, you know, the holiday show at Radio City. Oh, it's it's insane. And it's it, back then it was also Christmas eight months of the year. Yeah. You know, you, you'd yeah. start sometime in August and it would end sometime in February. Was it a hard adjustment for you moving to the big city and having all these kind of experiences? Uh, what was the hardest part of acclimating to New York? No, I always wanted to. I mean, that was always like, I always saw myself here. Um, and I actually left college after two years and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna move to New York. Um, and I'd spent a summer here, the summer between high school and college, uh, I lived here. A bunch of my friends were doing a summer dance intensive. I was not, <laughs> but they had free housing and I was like, let me crash. So I got a job as a busboy at Tavern on the Green. I had no clue what a busboy did, by the way. Again, like <laughs> lied my way into that job. Um, I don't think I ever bust a table the entire summer, which is what a busboy does. I never cleared it. It's like literally their job. <laughs> Correct. I stood there offering the tables bread. I was like, oh, this is great. I can, I can be the bread boy and just like dole out the bread from the basket. I mean, you were getting people uh, chunky even back then. <laughs> Hooked on cards. to buy cake and... I know, there is a theme. There is a theme, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the bar. Your life literally is like an HBO, you know, series. Like starting out there and then to see where you've, where you've come. Now, during all these kind of experiences in as a costumer in theater, were you baking this whole time? Or when, when did you actually be like, you know what? I, I'm going to start baking for real, not just, you know, a plate of cookies. So it it started at Radio City actually because Christmas, yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, I really want to make Christmas cookies, but of course we never did that. So um, I went to William Sonoma. I bought a KitchenAid, like you do <laughs> when you're interested in something, uh, and the uh, the like this like basic cookie cookbook. And I was like, let me teach myself how to make cookies, and I became obsessed with the creativity within the confines of science, mm -hmm. just based on the cookies. So I would make, you know, the oatmeal, the oatmeal raisin cookie. And I was like, oh, that works really well. What if I add blueberries? Fresh blueberries doesn't work. What if I add chocolate covered pretzels to the peanut butter cookie? Oh, this works. So I ended up waking up every morning at like 5 a.m. before a six show day uh -huh. and baking off a few batches of cookies and bringing them into work and, you know, pawning them off. And then it turned into people wanting to buy them for Christmas presents. And I was like, ooh, cookies for cash. Yeah, okay. Ching. And then Radio City was winding down for the season. And Sue Young, vegan mom of all people, was like, you're not auditioning. You're not talking about going on to another show in wardrobe or hair. All you're talking about are your cookies. Why don't you go to culinary school? Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me, that never was a thought. Like I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. Um, so I like went to apply to culinary school and they're like, what are you here for? And I'm like, I wanna make cookies. And they're like, we don't have a cookie program how do you feel about like the rest of pastry and I was like yeah okay fine <laughs> <laughs> um so I want to talk about like that first year going to culinary school where it went from baking for fun to now it's like here's some actual classes um it's just like when you actually study music theory in musical theater it kind of like snaps all the fun out of it because it's like here's the regimen classes what were some of the hardest things going to culinary school to kind of adjust to? What were your good classes? What were your terrible classes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, it's funny going into culinary school, I knew nothing, but you also like to think that you know everything, right? Or you learn one technique, 
you learn one way of doing things, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, I know how to do this. So I feel like there was kind of this initial like cockiness or like, oh, yep, learned it, done, check. And then it's like, no, no, there are seven ways to peel a grape. You know, there are, you, you need to like fully immerse yourself in this. But what I fell in love with was the same thing I loved with cookies, which was this, this creativity within the structure of science. And what I, I think what I realized was after years of therapy too, is as, as a creative kid and person, the, the structure of rules, having that to play with and to push against and to bend a little bit, um, I need that. I crave that. So it was like, all of a sudden, all of this like art design, science, all of these things that I was randomly good at came together in one field. Well, and I, I love your commentary, uh, especially uh, last night's episode of Halloween Bacon Championship. You were talking about the difference between like Italian cream and American cream, and you brought it down to the science about how like the fat adheres to, to, to the form, and that's why one cake was lower than the other. And I was like, God, and it's so fun when you add that because for somebody that knows nothing about yeah. cooking, it is such a great um, mix that there is this science to it. It's not just the creativity and it's not just throwing things um, together. Um, but like, I know sometimes it is hard to kind of adhere to this kind of structure and, you know, and the hard work. What were your terrible things? What like the first time you made was like awful? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Um my handwriting is horrible. Like I, I could have been a doctor or a serial killer, you know, with, with my handwriting. And every day at the beginning of class for like the first two months of culinary school, we had this like tracing paper basically and stencils that we'd have to pipe over in chocolate because they were trying to teach us basically right. how to write happy birthday or like happy anniversary or congratulations which i still can't spell um, <laughs> and that was just awful and and when i went into to running restaurants and people and these were like high-end establishments and people started asking for like oh can you write happy birthday on the plate or can you do that I'm like no we can give you a candle <laughs> <laughs> you're like it's very gourmet to just have a candle <laughs> I will not desecrate my dessert with a happy birthday uh in reality no I just can't write <laughs> Um, so, Zach, in growing up, you know, kind of being in the theater world and then costuming and, and now the culinary, when did you, when growing up, did you kind of realize that, hey, maybe I'm not like the other boys, maybe I have different feelings? Um, was it, was it a big issue for you growing up? Wait, I'm not like the other boys? I mean, that you like other boys. Uh, I like boys? <laughs> Girl. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, it... This was, it was, you know what, it was evident um, in kindergarten. Like I, I literally came home and asked my mother if it was okay for boys to like other boys. Wow. Because I had a really cute neighbor. I need to find him. I was going to say, where is he now? I don't want to know. I feel like I'm probably watching him. your show. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Um, with his family. Um, yeah. <laughs> his two kids. <laughs> and we're not going to name names. <laughs> um, and but, he's here right now. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it was it was painfully obvious to me from an early mm. age. And I have the most wonderful, accepting family, um, which sometimes makes it harder, especially because you are, it's like the opposite that a lot of people go through. You're accepted at home. And then you have to like deal with your friend group or school, you know? So I feel like I kind of had an, an opposite situation where it's like, I didn't tell my friends first, <laughs> like my parents knew. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know, I consider myself so incredibly lucky to have, have had this support system. And it wasn't until I went to college and moved to New York and, you know, made more queer friends that 
you realize that I realized like, oh, wow, like other people's experiences are not like this. There's a lot of pain attached to this. Um, so that was just incredibly eye opening for me. And, you know, what a reason why I work on behalf of, of so many incredible charities like the Ali Fournay Center, um, because I feel so incredibly lucky to have had the emotional support that I have from my family um, that, you know, I, I want to support these organizations that that give back and 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 provide that. Because it was, it was really shell shocking for me to be like, oh wait, that wasn't e that wasn't easy. You got you got kicked out. You got abused. You got. I mean, it it, it hit me really hard. Um, and I consider myself so so lucky. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's talk about your first kind of big gig at the Bouchon Bakery. Um, what advice do you have for a chef? For their first big gift. Did I say it wrong, by the way? I, I don't know. No, no, no. I was just I was, was just remembering back. So <laughs> Bouchon Bakery was opening in the Time Warner Center. It's Thomas Keller, you know, French Laundry per se. They had Bouchon in Napa and Yontville. This was like the huge opening. I was still in culinary school, and we we have to do internships at, at the end of culinary school. And I was like, you know what, I want to do this. I want to go right to the top. So I got a job while I was in culinary school working front of house, working the bakery counter there so I could ingratiate myself to the organization and, uh -huh. you know, become the, the first intern there. Um, and I was awful. I was so bad. <laughs> I, I was great at the front of the house, I can sell a baked good. But again, coming out of culinary school, it was like, I had no clue how these things operated, yet alone at, you know, I mean, it's the same, it was the same kitchen as per se. It's a Michelin three-star kitchen, yeah. like, uh, zero clue. Um, and <laughs> like my second day there, I, was taking a shortcut clearly because I needed to soften some peanut butter. So I took the whole jar of peanut butter and took the the foil off of it, except, you know, when you open a jar of peanut butter, there's a little foil ring yeah. on top. <laughs> and I popped it in the microwave in, in the climate control chocolate room, right? This like probably cost, I don't know, half a million dollars to build out. Um, and <laughs> toss it in, walk into the main kitchen. And next thing I know, there's like smoke billowing out. The fire alarm of the Time Warner Center <laughs> is going off. <laughs> um, and they didn't fire me, which uh, I feel very grateful for. Um, that could have been it. That could have been like, get oh, done, son. <laughs> I, I mean, I could have also just walked out. Um, <laughs> But with the peanut I, butter. I, I was too I was too dumb to do that. I was like, oh well, you know, we, we live to scoop cookies another day. Um <laughs> well, that's funny because that's kind of the attitude bakers need on the Halloween baking championship. It's like, hey, this was a fail. You just gotta keep on going. There's another day, there's another dessert, there's another step well, and that's for the, you. that's that is the obstacle for pastry chefs, especially in competition. So like when I did Top Chef Just Desserts, you know, everyone is so used to their home kitchens, yeah. every ingredient that they want. And like- The temperature we, is a certain way without the cameras yeah, and the lights ovens and all that. And, and, yeah. But like, you know, we're shopping at Ralph's. What, what specialty pastry ingredients can you get at Ralph's? You know, <laughs> so fairy. looking out because they're like, I don't have anything that I'm used to. And instead of being flexible and adapting, you know, they're they're focused on what they can't do. Yeah. I feel like my advantage on Top Chef desserts was I was like, we <laughs> <laughs> will just make it work. Um, and and it's that flexibility that I that I also try to coach the bakers on Halloween baking or any of the other shows yeah. where it's like get out of your head and move to plan C, move to plan D. You know your your initial plan is never going to work out, so just be flexible. 
Well, and that kind of is for all aspects of life. I feel that like you could write a baking book, but like it goes towards like life philosophy because that's for anything that, that you choose to. Oh, a hundred percent. But when you're in the throes of it, right? And that clock is, is counting there's a camera down, in your face. All of a sudden there's a camera in their face. There's yeah. a producer asking you what you're doing. And you're like, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm destroying my life. That's what I'm doing <laughs> on camera. Meanwhile, John Henson's in the corner laughing. <laughs> uh, oh my God. Wait, can we just take a sidebar, by the way? And can I tell you about John Henson? Okay. I have a few questions about him. So, growing up, talk I mean, soup. my father and I watched Talk Soup. Talk Soup every day. I had the biggest crush on John Henson. I mean, like... Zach, I have a question here. Do we still have a crush on John Henson is my question, and smash or pass? E even more so, and smash. Yeah. 100%. He's um, so cute! <laughs> he, is, he is the best. So, my... I was a replacement judge on Halloween. I came in on season three. Yes. And uh, we had got the call sheet. They hadn't told me who else was doing it, uh, you know, whatever. We got the call sheet the night before. Carla and I have been friends for 10 years, right? So I'm at the gym in the hotel in New Orleans and talking to Carla, who's on a layover in Chicago. And I'm like, it says John, host John pickup, 7 a.m. And I was like, who's John? And we were like racking our head of like, who who the John who could be hosting this was? So I leave the gym, I'm sweaty, I'm gross. I had flown in that day. I get in the elevator at the hotel and there's John Henson. <laughs> Doors open, Henson. And I go, I well, I scan all the way up because he's like 6'3", right? Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, you're John. <laughs> and he's good. He's, Yes. Yes, I am. And I'm like, lose all ability of speech. I'm like, me, Zach, M me judge. And then I hit the next floor button and walk off the elevator <laughs> and text the producers and say, you didn't tell me it was John Henson. Like, and please tell him I'm harmless. Um, we have become such good friends. He is not only, I mean, just a comedy gem and yes. like treasure trove of comedy too. Like, like he can give you everyone's routine that has ever been done. He's wow. so smart um, and so funny. And honestly, it's the stuff that never makes it to air. I mean- I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> wildly inappropriate. In the most delightful way. I mean, our and I do know, like, yes, the gays, the gays love him. Yes, I mean, anyone who does a Carol Channing impression as part of their joke. <laughs> um, and you guys have such a cute bromance. There's obviously mutual admiration there, and it's so joyful to see. And when they put him in flannel, I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, no, I know. He's I adorable. Know. I know. <laughs> Um, okay, I got this question from a chef. Um, you were at New York's Butter Restaurant. You were there for four years, which is a good chunk of time. Uh, they want to know, as a chef, how do you know when to stay at a gig or when it's time to kind of maybe take a chance or move on? Because getting a gig is a great thing. So is it foolish to leave? How, how, how did you make that decision? What's your advice? You know, I'm, I'm a lifer. You know, I I was at Butter for four years. I was with Bobby Shapiro and Flex Muscles and Zocalo and those restaurants for four years. I was with David Burke for eight. Um, and that I was still learning and growing. I was still able to learn and grow. And I feel like the litmus test for it is once you've truly exhausted, not think you've exhausted, not you're tired of the grind or you want a change of scenery, but when it's truly time to fly the coop and, and take the next step or do something completely different, that's the time to do it. I'll tell you when we're hiring cooks or sous chefs or executive chefs and we're looking at the resumes, people who do it a year here, a year there, I know it feels like a long period of time, especially in the kitchen. Kitchen years are like dog years. 
yeah. anti dog years. I don't yeah. know. One year in the kitchen is like, like three. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you, you have to stay. unless there's something so incredibly toxic, right? And and that's when you need to kind of draw your boundary and say, I'm out of here. This isn't worth it. The Michelin stars aren't worth it. You know. Mm. Um, but I am a huge fan of staying where you're at and asking for more too, even if you're at the top, right? Like I, with Craveable Hospitality Group, where Pie Caken started, we started it in the basement of one of our restaurants kind of as a joke That's and crazy. turned it into this whole retail thing. But that was me. I mean, I was a corporate pastry chef. We and a partner and we had, I don't know, 14 restaurants at that time. And wow. I wanted something else to do. So I, I said to our CEO, I was like, hey, um, do you mind if I figure out how to sell cakes out of the basement? And he's like, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> you started a revolution. And I did. Yeah. You know? um, let's talk about studying in France. Uh, how long were you there? And what could American chefs learn from French chefs the most? Um, so I was in and out. Um, I had these incredible opportunities to go and work with um, the team from Valrona Chocolate in Town L'Hermitage and then Chocolate Michel Cuisel up in Normandy as well. Uh, Valrona and I have a continuing relationship as well. Um, so uh, my, my first my first trip there uh, was, you know, to Valrona, which is, I mean, in my opinion, the best chocolate in the world. Um, uh, very specific, very French, their production facilities, but they also have an entire like training facility basically for chefs. And they have an incredible team of, of uh, chefs who work for them, who kind of lead these classes on how to use their product, you know, and, and at a very high level. And I, of course, went in there, I was, uh, I had been at Butter, which like, I mean, the food was so legit there. I mean, Alex Wernicelli, like pre-Food Network, Alex Wernicelli. Um, I mean, we took it from from a club, right, to yeah. like a, a truly like incredible restaurant. Um, but also like I was kind of, again, like this little punk mm -hmm. <laughs> from the States that you know, it was like, I have my way of doing things and it's very over the top and very American. And instead of being like the classic French chefs, the the chefs there were so entertained and like fascinated by it. And like, and said, you know, next time I'm in New York, I want to come to your restaurant. I want to see what, I want to see what you do because this isn't normal. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, you're right. This isn't normal. <laughs> um, so it was a really, it was a really incredible experience. And also, I mean, talk about your, your kind of foundations of pastry and the geeky science behind it, right? Yeah. Especially something like chocolate, which is so scientific in its use. I mean, it's a great creative me medium, but it's also a very fickle uh, artistic medium too. So yeah, I, it was, I had the most amazing experience there and it was very much them, me learning from them and them also kind of learning from what we're doing. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's the best kind of education. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you watch Hallmark or Lifetime holiday movies. Uh, the yeah, one... Yeah. <laughs> The one that gets me that it, I think it's the worst ever and I can't stop watching it. It's one where Lacey Chabert goes to the chocolate, uh, like some chocolate shop and it's this guy and he's competing, whatever. And she's like, you know, let's let's put in some rosemary or something ridiculous. And she changes the whole face of chocolate for the whole nation and they cheer her name and they win the competition. And the queen is like, you win, whatever. <laughs> and it's the most ridiculous. Kind of like, there I is always, watching it though. There is always a baking competition. <laughs> In, in like every Hallmark movie. I am I am personally upset that they have not called me for a cameo. Well, Zach, you know, 
a lot of Food Network and HGTV personalities are starting to creep in. Pioneer Woman, um, Hillary from Love It or List It. She's in a new holiday film. You just I have to have I, your agent call. I I have offered, but my agent has also called Dick Wolf too because I'm like I I want to be on SVU. I don't care 100%. if I'm sassy sassy barista or dead <laughs> hooker. Like doesn't matter. Give like Mariska her coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Beanson, be I Beanson. <laughs> that was what I just did. Good. You like that? Oh, I mean, I'd be on FBI yeah, too. Who? I mean, I, I, I am a sucker for an episodic crime drama. By the way, <laughs> I, I'm addicted to SVU. I mean, every season, every episode. Um, uh, yeah, yep, same. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a whole other podcast there, because um, some of the casting changes that are happening, I'm not a fan of. Oh. Um, uh, so I Kelly, talk. Giddish? Kelly Giddish, do we think she's on her way out? She is. She only has two more episodes. Why did you have to tell me that? I know. It's so depressing. And I, I'm, I'm just not okay with that. And I wonder what's going to happen to Carisi. Anyway, <laughs> I just want them to bring Danny back. Oh. Danny Pinto. Oh, girl. Mm. So good. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, also, super- also, huge fan of Andy Carl, too, although they killed him off. Right. Yeah, they did. So that would be odd if he were to come back, but yeah. But his wife is going on Housewives, so we're we're good. Are you serious? Her face going on Housewives, yeah. Oh, in the new, new cast? Yeah. Ah, I haven't seen everything from BravoCon yet, so I'm a little behind um, on, on I mean, on that's that. what I, I saw originally. I mean, who, who knows what happened between then and now? Uh, from what I hear, a lot happens. Anyway, <laughs> um, so not to bring the party down, but this... This is a theme. You know, the joke is, God, Zach, you are so fit, you know, and you're eating desserts and you're making desserts. So I want to know what kind of body issues you might have had to deal with, not only being on TV, but also being part of the LGBTQ community, which we know can be not the friendliest. Um, And then you're surrounded by food, food, food. How or have you had to deal with that? Do you have a ridiculous metabolism? I know you like to work out. Um, but what kind of body issues have you had to deal through this kind of food journey? You know, it's uh, it's interesting, and it's something that I didn't know was coming, by the way. And it's something that I also haven't, like, talked about publicly. I mean, mm. my friends all all know. and um, But, you know, like, I was, my weight has been, you know, up and down my whole life. You know, I was a skinny kid. I was... A, really chunky kid through high school really oh yeah oh yes the bar mitzvah album if you dig in my instagram you'll see i saw a chuck e cheese uh picture (laughs) yeah no that was skinny no no we'll we'll go to the bar mitzvah album uh but then you know performing dancing yeah all of that you know that and being queer too um in the 90s, right? When it was Twink Central, it was abs. 100%, 100% smooth. Every, yep. Michelle, smooth, yep. cross the tips. Um, so when my last season at Radio City, and I was just kind of disenchanted with entertainment, and I was disenchanted oh. with with what I was doing, not necessarily Radio City, but like just, just my life in general, um, I stopped eating. Oh my because God. it was the only thing I could control. And it got to the point where I think I was like 107 pounds. And, you know, like everyone started commenting about it, you know. And like, meanwhile, I thought like, oh, like I look good. Oh, finally, like I'm fitting this like, yeah. like twink uh, archetype. And it... Yeah, it got to the point where, you know, my mother was, my mother came to see the Christmas show and kind of like broke down in tears and was like, you don't look healthy. Like something is very wrong here. Um, And that was also at the same time that I started baking and started thinking about going to culinary school. So I actually went home to Maine for a few weeks. She was like, why don't you come home? Why don't we go to the doctor here? You know, we have a great like family doctor and like, let's, let's, let's talk about this. 
Um, so I go to the doctor and kind of tell him what I'm doing, right? And I'm I'm obsessing over calories and what I'm putting in my body because it's the only thing I can control. And he, instead of going the like anorexia treatment route, he went the OCD route because he was like, this is, this is kind of where your brain is going and this is what your, your focus is on. So once he kind of broke that cycle and like with medication and, and whatnot, all of a sudden, like all of that, all of that obsession went away. And I kind of came around to the fact that it was the only thing I could control in my life because the rest of it wasn't great. Um, and then there was the question of, is it really a good idea for me to go to culinary school? Given all of these, let's say, food issues. Um, and, you know, he said, let's try it, you know, and like, let's, let's see, see what happens. And so six months later, I think I had maybe gained 15 pounds, which is good very good. And like everything was going so well for me. So I went back to see him and I asked him, I was like, uh, you know, what, like, why would you say yes to that? Like to me going to culinary school and me kind of like putting myself in that scenario. And he said, you know, it's sink or swim. And uh, he said, you know, it's much like uh, one of my other patients who is a pyromaniac and wanted to become a welder. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that scans. So, you know, I, I just coming out of that and kind of recognizing my relationship with food and also pulling in some of the like, the, the values that my mom gave me growing up in terms of like my relationship with food and valuing it as fuel, as opposed to seeing it as, you know, like, oh, this isn't tasty. Yeah. Now it's a very, I would say I have a very healthy relationship. Um, but of course there, <laughs> do I overcompensate at the gym? Absolutely. Like every summer, am I like, oh, time to break out the caftan guess I'm going to cut carbs and stop drinking. Um, the, those influences don't go away. I think for me, my key is obsessing over it. Yeah. And when it starts to go down that spiral, it's like not worth it. I cannot thank you enough for, for sharing that. You know, we're in this culture of body positivity and inclusivity. Um, and the reality is it, we still have a lot to go as, as, as a gay community, number one, but even uh, as, you know, a, a nation um, a, a, as a whole, you know, these are still issues that we need to talk about, that we need to address. And the more we talk about it, the more we share our stories, the more people that we can help by just, just talking. Yeah. And I feel like every, you know, it, for better or for worse, food is the common denominator like of our lives. And that's one of the reasons that I, I love what I do, right? Because it, it's the universal language and it's something we can all relate over. And when it comes to our relationship with food and our bodies, I mean, that, is, that should be the easiest of conversations. And instead it becomes taboo yeah. or it becomes comparative. You know, like I was at an event last night sitting next to a model, um, female model, like clothes hanger, gorgeous. Oh my God, this dress. I'm like, I can't with you. And I remember the entree got dropped. It was short ribs. And of course I'm like looking over, I'm like, is she going to eat the short ribs? I guess she's not going to eat the short ribs. And then I'm like slapping my own hand. Yeah. I'm like, Psh that this is where it comes from. Um, so yeah, I agree. This is the universal conversation. Yeah. 
Uh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I know you're heading into uh, a major birthday next month. Um, and so I want to know, <laughs> how, how, has your, uh, how has your cooking changed the most? And how have you as a person changed the most? You're getting real deep here, okay? Oh, it's fine because then we have the Food Network fan questions okay, good, that are good, good, really good, good, good. out of control. Yeah, I really, I really like this. So yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot, especially where it comes to food, and I feel like, well, times change, food changes, right? And I feel like now I am more simple than ever, right? Mm. Like I feel like I. I became known for over the top sparkles, fire, sprinkles, glitter. And like, don't worry, that is still there. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. every year the costumes just get better and better and bigger and bigger. <laughs> yes. But like in, you know, like in the food, like, oh, yes, yeah. it's very much still there. Um, and I find myself going back to like these very mm. simple roots. And it, it's something that was also instilled in me at Bouchon, which as as high end and French as as that was, Thomas Keller's sim simplistic philosophy of food. I remember suggesting a muffin flavor, and I was like, uh, "We should do cranberry orange." And Sebastian Roxel, the the corporate pastry chef, was like, "No, it has to be either cranberry or orange." It was like, oh, yeah, there's a simplicity. I mean, I will always put orange with cranberry to hype yeah. the cranberry. Yeah. But like if you if you look on my Instagram and, and I should do a better job of saving them because I really put them in my stories. Yeah. You can. What I'm baking at home or on the weekend, it is, you know, something that is at its core simple. And I feel like I've I value the simplicity of even a slice of cake. Well, I, I think the last thing I saw uh, was you made it uh, like an apple uh, pie dish and the way that you show that, I mean, it was apple pie. And sometimes even on the baking championship, when when people like go overboard, they miss the point of it. And that's when they fail because they should just keep to basics at, well, at, at times. And simple is hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's very you naked. You hide a lot of stuff under glitter. You know, it's like when the fresh face models show up and you're yeah. like, do you, do you have anything on your face? Like, is that natural? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or when, versus when people show up with all of the lashes, mm -hmm. all of the glitter, the smoky eye, you're like, okay, you, yeah. you look amazing and you, you can hide anything. <laughs> um, uh, simple is hard. Um, and as a person <laughs> um i haven't changed <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars of therapy and i am still the same person um i've become much more self-aware mm -hmm. and a lot of that is being able to celebrate myself um and I feel like I had a 180 recourse to being on Bravo, being on Top Chef, right? Because I knew I filmed a TV show. I never realized that anyone would say anything to me about it in real life. And yeah. then people started saying things, right? And then you get a little bit of like an ego. And again, it's being young and cocky and it was kind of that way. It's natural. Too, right. So the 180 pendulum swing is like to not say anything, you know, and, and like when Top Chef came out, you know, everyone would be like, oh, my God, I love you. And you're like, I love you, too. Like woman with stroller. Yeah. And I remember I was I was in P-Town, Provincetown, arguably my favorite place in the world. And I was waiting in line for the bathroom at the A House, which is a, a bar club. Yep. Guy comes up to me and is like, excuse me, are you? And I'm like, yes, I, yes, I am. And he's like, waiting for the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, I am. Yes, yes, I am waiting for the bathroom. Here is me, a normal person 
just waiting for the bathroom. And like, that's when I shut it off because I was like, nope. But I swung that pendulum a little too far the other way, you mm -hmm. know? And and if you ask any of my friends, you know, they, they will say like, he is incredibly humble. And I feel like that is such a noble quality and something that I aspire to. And I feel like in pushing 40, like, I'm okay if someone asks me what I do. It's still hard, but like, if you ask me what I do, two years ago, I would have been like, uh, I, do, I do food. Like, I don't even know how to tell you yeah. what I do, right? <laughs> because you don't want to, you know, like, I don't know, success is relative, right? Like, I still have so much more to do. Yeah. So why, like, why would I lead with anything that I've done? And now I feel like I can say like, oh, well, you know, I started this direct to consumer company for baked goods and my night job is in media. And just- and That's still such there. a simple way to put it. I mean- it there. But you know what, being able to say that and being able to like celebrate what you've done, it, just, right. and it doesn't matter what you've done. You got a promotion at work. You started from nothing. You were the first person in, in your family to go to college. You didn't get a degree and you did this, right? Like there are all these things to celebrate and I feel like we should celebrate ourselves more. And I feel like for me marching into 40, like I'm like, you know what? I, I can be a little more comfortable, like. Ring them bells. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Liza. Yeah. <laughs> Loved your Liza, by the way. <laughs> but all of these thoughts, literally, I mean, it's like, it's like a life, uh, affirming book using uh, bakery allegories and and your career. Okay, so we're going to get into Food Network, and I just have to say, you know, I've been such a huge fan. Uh, my mom is obsessed with you, obsessed Hi, with mom. you. <laughs> She's watching, um, um, and it's a show that we really have bonded over. Because if somebody would have said, "Hey, you're going to be watching a food competition show," I'd be like, "Why? You can't smell it. You can't taste it. I can't cook worth shit." Um, and now it's like, I, I'm just like addicted. And I think a reason you have become such a fan favorite um, with with so many groups of people is because you are sincere. The way you give 110% in your costumes, in your delivery, in your comedy, but also you have this sincere that you care about the contestants. Um, and that really, really comes across. And so I just have to thank you for being such a sincere part of reality TV. Um, and I'm like fangirling right now. Because I feel like we become your friend when we see you week after week. It's like we're hanging out with Zach this week. Um, and, and Or Liza. The three of you. I'm Liza. <laughs> because, hey, why were you late to, uh, I, I think it was like the second episode. You know, like the gay in me was like, why was he late? And then you show up at the end. It's like. Um, I wasn't feeling well. Okay. And, uh, you know, we take safety and, and COVID things. Yep super, super seriously. So we just wanted to be like 100% uh, uh, sure that I was clear. I mean, we we test every day. Yep. We PCR three times a week. Like it, it it's a very rigorous. And uh, I just, I wasn't feeling well. And I, I was honest about that, uh, sure. should be. And luckily everyone, our production company, um, they are literally the best people to work for. You know, because their policy is if you're not if you're not feeling well, don't come to work 100%. and don't think of it as you're losing a paycheck because we're we're going to pay you like it's not worth it to anyone. No. So. Uh, so, yeah. So I wasn't feeling well. Um, we uh, I don't know if I can say this. We ended up driving a, a swab to the CDC lab in Atlanta because we're filming in Knoxville. <laughs> God, Just this is so high. <laughs> It's like a Michael um, Crichton book. <laughs> yes. Well, they have the hot, the most sensitive equipment, right? So yeah. like, let's just make sure. I mean, the lengths you will go for your fans Ended and up the feeling, contestants. Feeling fine midday. Every, all like 17 tests came back negative. Like it, it was fine. It was, I mean, Knoxville pollen, by the way, no bueno. <laughs> Allergy was very bad. So, uh, so then they're like, oh, like we want you to come back in for elimination. And I'm like, how are you going to spin that story? Um, slash, you want me to come back on the first episode to watch like the first person go home? Yeah. Who 
those cakes I haven't tried. <laughs> You're like, bye. <laughs> sure. So it I'm worked. Like, uh, I'm like, all right, well, uh, can I get like a bathrobe? They're, they're like, we don't have time to do your full costume, clearly. Uh, I was like, can I get a bathrobe, like a rubber duck and a shower? That was cute. Like, Absolutely. And I think I walked, I think I walked back in and I was like, what did I miss? <laughs> And John Hanson, the court was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so, so like, let's <laughs> let's answer some of these Food Network yeah. questions. Okay. These are from your fans. I know some of them you probably can't answer, but we're going to ask you anyway. Um, the three of you seem to have such great chemistry. How much time do you, Stephanie and Carla, hang out outside of the show? show? Uh, the whole time. Um, we, we actually do our makeup, hair and makeup together instead of in our separate dressing rooms. Uh, and then, actually, the four of us, John included, go out for dinner every well, night. Which... Look at this picture. <laughs> oh my God, that, okay, so that was last season when we are, one of our days off, I was like, we're going to Dollywood. That is so awesome. Yep. That, that, that That is awesome. I asked, so we were filming in Knoxville and I asked them, they were like, do you want car service to set or do you want us to rent you a car? And I was like, no, I want you to rent me a truck. Because he wanted <laughs> so but. So I drove everyone in my truck to Dollywood. Uh, what happens when two of you agree and the third does not agree? Is it majority rules or is it does it go to the producers? Fist fight. <laughs> um, I lose. Okay. I lose by the way. <laughs> Stephanie, she has a strong right hook. Um, I want to hang out with her. I want to go to every happy hour in every major city with her. Like Stephanie's she, literally the best. Uh, so smart too, um, and funny. But uh, but realistically, um, we will convince each other to 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 join the majority there's never been a, a deadlock like that um so are you staying at an airbnb is it a hotel like are you all living on the same floor what's happening hotel for halloween baking although this year carla got an airbnb because she was filming holiday right after oh. so we felt a little jilted because we normally go to the restaurant in the, the bar yeah and we have our like normal order of like a salmon caesar salad uh <laughs> this chubby shrimp cocktail <laughs> and i make them make a steak tartare because well one i'm obsessed with steak tartare two i saw it on the menu before we checked in the first year we shot it there and they've since changed the menu but i'm like every time mm -hmm. i go back i'm like can you make that steak <laughs> All right. Um, this question is from a gay, obviously. Are you on the apps when you're out of town filming? Seamless. I'm on Grubhub. <laughs> Good answer. How much of the dessert are you actually eating? Depends on how good it is. I mean, I... I've seen... The oh. thing is, it's like when they have so many components and then I see you guys kind of nibble, I'm like, ooh, that must not taste good because you're just like... Well, but I mean, sometimes it just depends on the shot, right? It depends on like when they actually film us. I mean, yeah. I have clean plate club, you know, like I have no problem showing my clean plate. I don't actually have a hunger or full meter in uh, me. Join the club. <laughs> um, so I, I will eat everything that's in front of me. Um, I would say normally I eat half the portion across the board because you need to be fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's literally your job to eat. So suck it up. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is the follow-up question. Is how do you prep for a day of tasting? Are you skipping breakfast? Are you like fasting before so you can eat all that? Or No, you no? got to stretch it out. You got to push the walls, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a creature of habit. So every morning, my venti unsweetened Starbucks iced coffee and the spinach feta egg white wrap. But that's every, every day of of the year <laughs> unless they're out of it and then hell hath no fury and then it's the steak tartare uh <laughs> how much time are you spending with the contestants or you do you just see them while they're at the actual filming and you're judging them we only see them while we're filming wow. um uh they, they, it's kind of like a, a hard line um yeah. you don't want to you can't be friends until after and then yeah. we become friends um but they're all so good. And they're all, I mean, especially this season, they are incredible. And they're like wonderful people too. So, it was well, so 
and here's here's one of your fans wants to know is it hard to remain objective based on the food when you come to love some of their personalities and you're just like oh you know we love them so much the ones that make you laugh the ones you just feel good about um and then their food is it hard to remain objective <laughs> not really actually it, it it's it's harder to like deliver the truth to them because you're like i like you as a person kind of like my mother would say to me like i love you i don't love all of the decisions that you make um but no because it's about the work um do you usually have a good idea of who's going to last based on the first challenge uh i am always wrong really <laughs> really no except for, no i was right for three seasons. Okay. Okay. Um, how but come again? It's it's not about who's the best. It's about who has the worst day. <laughs> oh, hey, it's that is that's very true. You know, it happened this it happened this season. Yeah. Where, I mean, this season was very strong, but you know, I can say like Marixa on this season. Yeah. Ridiculously talented. So incredibly strong had a bad round and it's like can't do oh, anything like that, and you know? sometimes it hurts so here's here's a follow-up question uh one of your fans has a real problem with the rules <laughs> they want to know how come a baker's past wins don't save them when they have a bad day it's like well they have eight winning desserts and then they have a crappy day that can't save them at all you know it has to be formulaic mm, like there yeah. there has to be that rule because if yeah. not you're going to keep going back to what what someone did before and that's what sucks right yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you are hilarious. Everybody's hilarious. Are you writing your own puns? Do you get time to write them down? Like Drag Race, they get two attempts to write <laughs> down their jokes. They um, get time? No, I get no time. That is all, that is all on the fly. Um, oh, that is good. Nothing that fed. is good. Yeah, nothing scripted, nothing fed. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Well, it's funny because sometimes I see John Henson look over like, God damn, why didn't I say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, because sometimes the host stuff is scripted. Yeah, yeah. Like his intros and whatever clearly are like pre-written. The way um, he is so John, committed to that, by John the way. Also, well, but John also will like go off script. Yeah, yeah I can right. imagine a lot ends up on, on the cutting room. Uh, what has been one of your favorite costumes? Which one was your least favorite to wear? So my least favorite, my least favorite to wear, which actually turned into one of my most favorites, was the cupcake, which actually you guys uh, showed a picture Hilarious. of. Hilarious. But it, but it was your <laughs> attitude. Correct. Well, I decided, I was like, you know what, I am, we're going to make this a bit. So it, something was happening in production. It, we were, we were behind. And like the beauty of Halloween Baking Championship is it is kind of a community theater production, which is what makes it so good. Carla and I were literally talking about it today. She called me just to give me a voice hug. Oh my God, how sweet. Like, Carla Hall. Um, anyway, so something happened. We had to do this last minute thing. It ended up being like not, the, it was like maybe an Amazon thing out of the <laughs> package that they were like, oh, we're going to jazz it up. And hey, I was city. Like, and I was like, this is this is yeah no and then i was like you know what? i'm gonna embrace it i'm gonna be a stale cupcake <laughs> and that's and i told my makeup artist that and she was like she was like yeah but i'm gonna go the opposite direction too like we're gonna do rosy cheeks we're gonna do freckles i'm like it was so better. good i mean that was like a one-man <laughs> show waiting to happen it's like i want to go see the cupcake and hear this cupcake's life story people made fan art out of it like <laughs> yeah, of course I'm sure there's a tattoo out there in an interesting place, too. I mean, if you have it, show me. <laughs> um, so this comes from another gay. Have you ever dated a contestant after the show? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dramatic pause. Yeah. Um, I, uh, wait, have I? No. <laughs> Even like, uh, like, like one date. You know, pardon the French. I, um, I don't shit where I eat. Okay. And that's a that's not a, a moral high ground. That's not anything. It was even in the restaurants. Like, I never dated a, a waiter or a cook or, or anyone who worked there. And it was not again like I wasn't separating church and state or work and home. Um, 
I just also feel like it's a different relationship. Mm. That's that's pretty responsible because I have to say the waiters in New York are the hottest in any city at any given time. Well, I didn't say I didn't date waiters. Well, Just I mean, but I'm the saying... ones who worked in our restaurant. <laughs> okay, this one's a funny one. Can you all say acidity just one more time? What does that actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> acidity? I swear to God, if you play a drinking game, if you watch back, and it's like the acidity cuts through, it's every critique, and it's like, you know what okay, it is? What does I that put really a moratorium. Mean? I put a moratorium on the word moist. moist. So I was well, like. So we have to choose something else to talk about. But again, like the acid in a dish, right? It's so, when you're you're counterbalancing sweet, right? But what, what is the you acid? Does it mean salty? just like a sour taste? Does it mean? Correct. Okay. Sour. Yeah, salt, well, it's any contrast to sweet. So it could be bitter, salty, sour, acidic. I mean, it's acid, it's vinegar, it's citrus, it's lemon. I cannot tell you what a joy it is to laugh with you about it, especially watching it week after week and be like, oh, time to take another sip. There's acidity going on. When I have dinner with my mom, I swear to God, I'll be like, how's the acidity? I'm not even kidding. It's like our biggest joke. It's, it's about it's about balancing the sweetness. There's, there's ways to achieve it, but we do love acid. Um, I think this probably comes from the same fan is, do people actually... Uh, cook with cardamom and what does it taste for somebody who doesn't know <laughs> what's cardamom <laughs> I mean um, so uh, cardamom is uh, I would say like the fifth warm spice after like the classic pumpkin pie spices sporty spice sure sure right, scary right. spice ginger <laughs> spice uh, so uh, cardamom it, it has a warmth to it it also has a little bit of acidity <laughs> um it, it, it has some citrusy notes to it uh, um, so it's warm but citrusy uh we got so many other fan questions obviously we can't get through them all um i just need everybody to know the pie cake is totally deliverable it comes in the perfect condition and i got it delivered um to los angeles it made the holiday it was amazing but it it won't last as long as you think at all um, it was gone within three days, and that is a big piece of of dessert. So that, with the business happening, with the show happening, with everything that that as as a businessman and just dominating uh, media right now, what is your life priority? Is it growing the business? Is it growing your TV personality? Is it working on a cookbook? What would you say is your first priority when you wake up? You know, I I love the media stuff. Um, and, and what I said when I started doing it was I'll do it as long as it's fun. Um, and that was also a, a recoil from kind of my theater days of like, I don't want to feel like I'm ever pounding pavement. Yeah. Um, I will just keep doing it until it's fun. Um, and I haven't really said no to anything since. Um, but yeah, my day job, I mean, our direct to consumer business is insane. We did a project for Costco last year. There's a ton more like retail things that we're working on. Um, and I love it. But it is very weird to go from like being in the kitchen for 14, 16 hours a day every day to like growing a biz growing a business. Yeah. I barely have a BFA in musical theater. <laughs> like and I'm like, you know. You're like, I did death of a salesman one time. That's as much business experience as I have. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I watch Mommy Dearest. I know how board meetings go. Don't fuck with hey, me. Hey, that's a costume you haven't done yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, this is this is a fun question. Is What is your go-to baking dish to wow a date or to impress somebody um, that, that you would make at home? McDonald's soft serve. <laughs> The acidity. I go, <laughs> my go-to dessert. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I do have a freezer full of cookie dough. Oh. Do you, you know? Do you, it's how it all started, and it's yeah. also like uh, immediate gratification. I love that. 
And right? I'm I'm a cookie monster. I have never met a cookie that I will say no to, even if I like, oh, I don't like those. It, they'll be gone. I am a legitimate cookie monster. Same. I'm like, these are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's what I do. <laughs> All right, Zach, as we're nearing the holidays, I have to know, and it's so cheesy, but it's a cute question, is what are you most thankful for this year? Um, wow. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for my chosen family. I'm always thankful for my blood family. Um, I'm so incredibly thankful for my friends, my core group of friends, especially going into 40, right, um, who have been with me through everything um, and are my biggest cheerleaders, are the ones who um, push me, who call me out, um, you know, like that. They're irreplaceable. Um, and I feel like a lot of times when work gets crazy or I'm traveling or whatever, it's not, I don't forget about them because there's so much a part of me, but I'm so grateful to, to be back and, and spending time with them. So it's, it's that, that crew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Next time you're on the West coast, we got to do a uh, bakery tasting at the Abbey over cocktails. Yeah. Um, Cause that's go to the cheesecake do. factory. I mean, <laughs> at the Grove. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Marina Del Rey, actually, is my oh, favorite. I've not been to that one. It's we will have to sample. <laughs> <laughs> we will go. Zach, I, I cannot thank you. Like I said, a total fangirl here. Um, getting to spend time with you every week on such a fun show. Um, and then for you sharing so much of your personal life. Um, it really means a lot to me. And I know it means a lot to your fans and our audience. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Where do you want people to find you and follow you? And where can we order a pie cake in? Uh, well, I mean, you can find me on the Instagram, Zach underscore Young, Z-A-C underscore Y-O-U-N-G. Um, and uh, pie cake in bake shop, Gold Belly, shipped right to your door, goldbelly.com. Gold Not Belly's amazing. Pie cake -ins, but like literally anything else that you want. <laughs> yeah, literally everything. And, and for, you, you don't have to wait for the holidays. You can get a pie cake in any time of the year. <laughs> well, I mean, we do. Yeah, we have like seven of them. Clearly, yeah. we have our full calendar. Um, and they freeze beautifully, too. They Well, if I yeah. had any leftovers. <laughs> well, yeah, if, <laughs> if you have leftovers, which. <laughs> thank you, know. you. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to see the finale of the Halloween Bacon Championship. Uh, you, you can catch the whole season on Food Network. Um, it's such a fun ride. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, and that's all, folks. It's always a grab bag of fun here on On The Rock. A big thank you to our engineer, Tony Sweet, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Coming up for our Halloween episode, we have cast members from the original uh, Charmed, by the way. And we don't just have like an extra. We have some big names coming in, so you're going to want to come back for that. Please like, share, subscribe so we can keep bringing you this fabulous programming coming your way. And I don't have to drive home, so I'm going to have another cocktail. Mm -hmm. um, and until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy. More importantly, stay tipsy. See you next week. Thank you. another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at OnTheRocksRadioShow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week. <laughs>